Welcome. I welcome you all to this lecture in the course Introduction to Paninian Grammar. In this lecture, we are going to study the concept of compositionality, which is explored and which is the base for the grammatical system developed by Panini in his grammar. We have looked at in detail the process of speech production, but that was an internal stage that we looked at that we studied and now we can also analyze the external audible speech and obviously that is what we do as a methodology. We hear the speech in the process of communication and from that audible speech form we then theorize about the internal aspect of this expression which acts as a cause of this expression in the form of the audible speech. So audible speech is the expression, audible speech is the external most part of the process of speech production and the internal cognitive aspect is the cause and the innermost part of the process. It is also the very beginning of the process, the initial point in the process of speech production. So this is a journey that starts from the external most part of the process of speech production which is audible, which is in the public domain and from this by doing various kinds of analysis by asking several questions using a particular methodology which we shall see now, we think about and we theorize about the internal cognitive aspect of this external expression. We do this primarily because we note that sometimes when the audible speech is absent, we still see the communication happening. And based on this contrastive experience, we deduce the fact that there is something internal which is independent of the external audible speech. We start our investigations from this and then reach the cognitive aspect which we have studied in detail before. Now coming back to the external speech, in the last lecture we once again looked at the external speech and the cause and effect relationship. We stated that the Atma Buddhya Sametyarthan stage which involves the Arthakasha, part of Arthakasha and also part of Shabdakasha which is linked so this Arthakasha come into play and it is these two which are located within the intellect which are part of this stage called Atma Buddhya Sametyarthan which then get converted into the audible speech signal. This audible speech signal is said to be compositional in a particular manner from a particular point of view. But as opposed to that, the other view is that these audible speech signals which are produced 
are indivisible. So there is non-compositionality which also exists and we shall start our lecture by studying this particular aspect related to the compositionality called non-compositionality, indivisibility or akhandatva. In the previous lecture we saw that the sentence meaning from 1 to 12 was put in square bracket. The square brackets are used to indicate the one whole, one undivided nature of the sentence meaning which gives rise to the 12 sentences together with the features of the accents. They were also put in square brackets thereby indicating that they are also indivisible units. So units which are part of the Arthakasha and units which are part of the Shabdakasha which are linked together and are located in the intellect, they both are indivisible which give rise to an indivisible audible speech which is part of communication. We however break that external speech into components and what process do we adopt to do this? We shall study in the course of this lecture. First let us look at the concept of indivisibility or akhandatva. So this we notice as part of the process of communication, the feature of akhandatva. In the intellect, the sentence meaning and the sentence, arthakasha and shabdakasha and parts of them which are interrelated as conveyed and the conveyor, it is the sentence meaning which is the conveyed, what is con to be conveyed and the sentence is the conveyor, that is how they are related. To use the Sanskrit terms, the sentence meaning is vachya and the sentence is vachaka. These two, both of them, they act as one indivisible unit. This is also shown with square brackets around them, both sentence meaning and the sentence which are part of the intellect, buddhi. They are non-compositional in nature. One sentence meaning as one unit gives rise to one sentence as one unit from the point of view of the speaker. From the point of view of the hearer, the same thing can be said as follows, namely that one sentence which is heard acts as a cause which gives rise to the one sentence meaning one undivided whole. So the cause is one undivided, the effect is one undivided. This is how the process of communication happens both at the speaker's end as well as at the hearer's end. So akhandatva or non-compositionality is in fact a very much experienced part of the process of communication involving the audible speech sounds. <clears throat> but at times we also experience that the speech gets divided. In fact, we have lots of tools, lot of material to divide this indivisible speech into components. We have dictionaries, we have different types of dictionaries, we have thesauri, we have grammatical rules prescribing the construction, the generation of the sentence and so on and so forth. So the divisibility is also explicitly stated by various tools. Now we say that the divisibility or sakhandatva is also located in the intellect, the sentence meaning and the sentence which are interrelated as the conveyed and the conveyor, the sentence meaning is what is conveyed and the sentence is what is the conveyor. Both these, they are cognized as, they act as a collection or a whole of multiple parts. 
So, when we say this that there are multiple parts and there is a whole and this is a collection and so on, we accept the fact that this one whole is divisible into multiple parts and it is these multiple parts which make this one whole. It is their combination that has made this one whole and this one whole can be dissembled into its parts. So, this one whole is cognized as divisible and is considered to be compositional in nature. We remark that it is the observation that both these features the compositionality as well as non-compositionality coexist. They are features of both the sentence meaning and the sentence and act at different levels and are objects of different experiences and they are real. Both of them are experienced compositionality as well as non-compositionality sakhandatva as well as akhandatva they both are experienced as far as the sentence meaning and the sentence is concerned. Both of them go hand in hand. When we say that a sentence is indivisible we assume that there are components and yet it is one undivided. Similarly when we say that the sentence is divisible we assume that there are no components in fact there is only one whole but that can be divided and so on and so forth. So, the theory of Sarva Satyavada is propounded and explains both these features and explains the coexistence of both these features of compositionality Sakhandatva and non-compositionality Akhandatva Sarva Satyavada. The Sutra is Sarva Satyavada Siddhantaha. Now, if we study the compositionality which is the title of the lecture also, this is precisely because this is what is an important source for a grammarian. This is the profession of grammarian. The profession of grammarian is based on this particular concept of compositionality. This is the major task of any grammar to figure out the components of one undivided speech from the available evidence collected through the audible speech signals and then look at the components, look at the possible divisions of this speech. And initially when we looked at the earliest references of grammatical activity in the context of India, we noticed that in the Vedic literature there is a story where Indra the grammarian is being commissioned to cut, to divide this speech into its components and it is Indra it is said tam indraha madhyataha avakarot. So, Indra then did divide this particular speech which was one indivisible unit and Indra did divide it into its components. Now to just divide the components is one thing but to establish them after having divided them is another and that requires quite a lot of reasoning, classification and so on and so forth. So, this compositionality then we say that it works at three levels in the Paninian grammar, artha level the meaning level, shabda level the word level and also the swara namely the accent level. So, in other words meaning is compositional. So, earlier we were saying that the meaning is one indivisible unit shown in the square brackets. Now, we will say that this one 
undivided whole has components in terms of meaning. There will be meaning components which we shall study in the next lecture. The meanings can further be classified into some components, some divisions, some categories. There are some meanings which are conveyed as relations, some as the meanings of the lexical items. This we shall study in the coming lecture. But the point is that the meaning is compositional. There are components. Then the word can also be shown to be compositional corresponding with the meaning compositionality. That is most important because meaning acts as the cause which gives rise to the Shabda in the intellect and then this Shabda gets expressed in the audible speech together with the accent. Now we are saying here that there are three levels, Artha, Shabda and Swara, they are all part of the cognitive apparatus first, the Buddhi first and then the Shabda together with the Swara gets expressed in the audible speech. And whether we have expressed the Shabda as well as the Swara correctly to convey the meaning or not is counter checked. And this process of counter checking on the part of the speaker relies heavily on this intellectual programming in the form of the compositionality of Artha, Shabda and Swara located in the intellect. So now the meaning compositionality corresponds with the word compositionality and also corresponds with the compositionality that exists in the level of accent. Even though we said that accent is a different level, earlier we shown, we showed it to be a part of the word level. That is true because it comes together with the word. There is no separate accent available, but as Paninian grammatical derivation process shows that accent acts as an important feature. Generally the word derivation process and the accent derivation process are independent. There is some interface, but generally they are independent. But the meaning of course is primary, it comes before these two levels. So, the compositionality is thus playing an important role in the process of speech production as well. The compositionality is also viewed as apodhara in the Paninian grammatical tradition, the later Paninian grammatical tradition. Apodhara stands for extraction, extracting something imaginary from the real. One undivided sentence meaning is the real and compositional sentence meaning, sentence meaning divided into parts is all imaginary. One undivided sentence similarly is the real and the compositional sentence that means the parts of the sentence, this aspect is imaginary. This is what is the underlying principle in the concept of extraction or apodhara also stated in the Paninian grammatical tradition. Now it is important for us to also study the methodology used to figure out the compositionality which means to decide about the components of both sentence meaning as well as the sentence. Remember they both are located primarily in the intellect and the audible speech is just the external expression of it. So it is from this audible speech we go deep down to these two Shabdakashas and Arthakasha located in the intellect. Now the methodology used and is this as described in the Paninian grammatical tradition is with reference to the two words Avap and Udvap insertion and extraction and what this means will become clear in a while. What it means is corresponding the similarities in the meanings to the similarities of the words. 
the 12 sentence meanings and the 12 sentences that we have seen so far, we correspond the similarities. These similarities and dissimilarities are observable. The similarities on the one hand in the meanings and the similarities on the other hand in the sentences. These can be, can be corresponded to with each other. Similarly, corresponding the dissimilarities in the meanings to the dissimilarities of the words. This is what is avapa and udvapa. By doing this and by doing this recursively, so the recursive application of this particular methodology, find out the similarities and in the meaning and then associate them, correspond them with the similarities in the sentence, find out the, find out the dissimilarities in the meaning and then correspond them or associate them with the dissimilarities of the words and do this recursively, this results in exploring and finding out the meaning components which correspond to the word components. This is how this methodology gives us the components which are considered as separate independent components of the sentence, these components construct these sentence and these components of the sentence meanings construct the sentence meaning as one whole. This is what is in a nutshell this methodology. Let us now study this methodology with the help of the source given on the slide. This is taken from the Vyakarana Mahabhashya of Patanjali and this is commenting on Ashtadhyayi 1.2.45 and discussing the methodology. The words used by the Vyakarana Mahabhashya to describe this methodology is Anvaya and Vyatireka, not different than the ones that we saw earlier, only in the focus there is difference. <coughs> So here are some sentences taken from this source and I will read those sentences and then we shall spend time in analyzing this source and trying to understand what it means and how this methodology gets explained. Iha, the first sentence, Iha vrikshaityukte kaschit shabda shruyate, vriksha shabdo akarantaha sakarascha pratyayaha. The second sentence is Arthopi kaschit gamyate moolas kandha phala palashavan ekatvancha. The third sentence is Vrikshavityukte kaschit shabdo hiyate kaschit upajayate kaschit anvayi. The fourth sentence is Ekatvam hiyate dvitvam upajayate. Moolas kandha phalapalashavan anvayi. The next sentence is Te manyamahe yashabdo hiyate tasya savartho yortho hiyate yashabda upajayate tasya savartho yortho upajayate yashabdo anvayi tasya savartho yortho anvayi. It is in this passage that this methodology gets explicitly expressed. Let us study each sentence one by one in detail. It says, Iha vrikshaha ityukte kaschit shabda shruyate. So all these sentences, they need to be taken into account as one unit. We shall go back to all these five sentences. The remarks that we want to pass on these five sentences is that there is a particular process that underlies these five sentences. It describes, for example, the first sentence describes a particular word in a particular case with a particular number and then it says that when this word is uttered a particular meaning is understood together with the number. 
now you utter the same word but with a different number. The case could be similar but the number should be different and then you recognize that there is something dissimilar. Notably, some word is dissimilar. Similarly, some meaning also is dissimilar and that dissimilar meaning is stated. And this you go on doing. In this process, one also recognizes some meaning that remains, some meaning that changes. And then you go on doing this recursively, later on you keep assigning the similar part in the meaning with the similar part in the word and the dissimilar part in the meaning with the dissimilar part of the word. And then you assign the meanings which are similar to the similar words and you assign the meanings which are dissimilar to the dissimilar words. When we say assign, we mean that then it is fixed according to the rules that when a particular component is uttered and is part of the audible speech, then the hearer will understand a particular component mentioned as the meaning component. This is the rule based fixed system that is what is meant by assignment. When we say that one element is assigned to another element in this process. This is how a grammarian functions. Now with this much background information about this passage, let us study each sentence and try to understand what it means. Let us look at the first sentence. Eha vrakshaha ityukte kaschit shabda shruyate. Vraksha shabdo akarantaha sakarascha pratyayaha. What it means is when the word vrakshaha is uttered, some word is heard. So somebody is uttering the word vraksha, the hearer hears the word vrakshaha. In this word, there is a word vraksha together with the suffix s coming at the end of it, vrakshas, according to the existing grammatical system. Arthopi kaschit gamyate. We go to the second sentence now. Arthopi kaschit gamyate. Mulas kandha phalapalashavan ekatvancha. And when the word vriksha is uttered and some word is heard and its components are known to the grammarians as vriksha and sa, now this shabda which is heard by the speaker also conveys some meaning. Even the meaning is cognized, namely something, some entity which possesses the root, mula, the trunk, the skandha. The fruit, fala, leaf, palasha, and so on, and oneness, ekatvamcha. This is the meaning one cognizes as well from this word. Now, in the same process, when the same speaker utters another word, vrakshau ityukti, the speaker now utters the word vrakshau. So the hearer, Hears the word brakshau, kaschit shabdo hiyate. And then he notices that in this second utterance of brakshau, there is something missing and something common with respect to the previous utterance. Earlier utterance is brakshaha, this utterance is brakshau. Something is similar and something is dissimilar. Kaschit shabdo hiyate. Some word was removed. Sa is removed, kaschid upajayate, and some word is added, au is added, kaschid anvayi. Some word remains connected with the previous utterance, namely vriksha. So, when the word vrikshau is uttered, some word is lost, sa is lost, some has arrived newly, au is such a word, 
and then some bird remains connected with the previous one namely vriksha. Just as this is observed with reference to a word, so also is observed with reference to the meaning ekatvam hiyate, dritvam upajayate, mulas kandha phalapalashaban andvayi. So, what it means is even in the meaning part, it is observed that when vrikshaha is uttered, the oneness is cognized. Now, when vrikshav is uttered, two-ness is cognized. Now, this oneness cognized in vrikshaha is lost, but two-ness has arrived. Dvitvam upajayate and mulas kandha phalapalashaban anvayi. The meaning namely, which is put in the single inverted comma, the possessor of the root, trunk, fruit and leaf, this particular meaning component remains connected with the previous meaning cognized from the word vrikshaha. Then after performing this action recursively, one arrives at the following conclusion, te manyamahe, yash shabdo hiyate, tasya asavarthaha yortho hiyate, yash shabdo upajayate, tasya asavarthaha yortho upajayate, yash shabdo anvayi, tasya asavarthaha yortho anvayi. Then they think that this is its meaning which is lost, whose word is lost. So, sir is lost and so the meaning of that sir, namely oneness is also lost. So, oneness is the meaning of sir. This is how we extract the correspondence, extract the components. The oneness is the meaning of sir. And now the meaning which is newly arrived at is the meaning of that word which is newly arrived. And so the two-ness which is being brought by au is now the meaning of this au. The meaning which is newly arrived at is the meaning of that word which is newly arrived. Two-ness is the meaning of au. One-ness is the meaning of sir. Two-ness is the meaning of au and the possessor of the root as well as the trunk as well as the fruit and the leaf, this was linked with the meaning even in the earlier utterance. So, this meaning must be the meaning of the word which is connected as far as the Shabda, Shabda is concerned. This is what is the meaning of this passage which aptly describes the process of Anvaya Vetireka or Avapa Udvapa. Following this method recursively, the components of the sentence can be arrived at and they correspond with the components of the sentence meaning Further applying the same process, these components can be also shown to possess components, subcomponents and the meaning conditions also apply. That means that the component meanings can also be shown by application of this method recursively to possess the subcomponent meanings. This is how the grammatical process continues, continues to go deeper. It is these subcomponents then are considered by us as linguistic atoms and we shall explain this fact later on when we go to the subcomponents by applying this particular methodology as far as the meaning and the word and the swara is concerned. To summarize, the Paninian grammatical tradition recognizes different levels 
at which the speech functions. And then the speech sentence is considered indivisible from one point of view in the communication. The speech sentence is considered divisible from another point of view, namely the view of the grammarian. The principle of contrast allows one to extract meanings and corresponding words from these whole units. One thing to remember here is that this extraction happens simultaneously at both or all the levels. When meaning extraction happens simultaneously the corresponding word extraction and the corresponding accent extraction also happens. No extraction happens in isolation. This is an extremely important point to remember. <coughs> Now to conclude today's lecture, we shall follow our practice and recite a Mangala Charana at the beginning of the most celebrated commentary of 18th century called Udyota composed by the great scholar Nagesha. This commentary comments on the Vyakarana Mahabhashya written by Patanjali and also another commentary on this Vyakarana Mahabhashya called Pradipa composed by another great scholar called Kayyata. So Udyota is a commentary on the commentary and as well as a commentary on the original text called Vyakarana Mahabhashya of Patanjali. There are two verses and I read them. Natva Samba Shivam Devim Vagadhishthanikam Gurun Paninyadi Munin Vandyan Pitaraucha Sati Shivau Na vistirnam, na vistirnam, madhyanam api bodhakritu, bhashya pradipa vyakhyanam, kurve hantu yathamati. And I repeat, <coughs> natva samba shivam devim, vagadhishthanikam gurun, paninyadi munin vandyan, pitaraucha sati shivau, na vistirnam, Na vistiranam madhyanam api bodhakritu bhashya pradipa vyakhyanam kurve hantu yathamati. We end today's class with the five sutras taken from the second sub chapter of the fifth chapter of the Ashtadhyayi, the Panchama Adhyaya, Dvitiya Pada of the Ashtadhyayi. And these five sutras are. Dhanyanam bhavane kshetre khai, vrihi shalyor dhak, yava yavaka shastika dhyat, vibhasha tila mashoma bhanganu bhyaha, sarva charmana kritakha khayau. I repeat, Dhanyanam bhavane kshetre khai, vrihi shalyor dhak, yava yavaka shastika dhyat, vibhasha Tila Mashoma Bhanganu Bhyaha and Sarva Charmana Krita Khayam. Thank you for your attention.